Well, Dr. Jeff, you are the author of 12 books, including your latest on cancel culture. I mean, could there be a more timely topic? So tell us about this book and why you wrote it. Well, Leah, we've got 5% of the people in the country who are super mean to everybody else. And they believe that it's a mark of virtue to try to harm other people for saying what they say. But they have gained so much power that it's got 95% of the people in the country very afraid. I mean, cancel culture, and you know the history of it, we, it started off as people telling corporations, I'm not going to buy your product anymore if you're going to support this kind of an agenda. But it quickly morphed into people trying to harm others. The message moved from being, I disagree with you for what you say, to I'm going to stop you from communicating. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to try to get you off of Facebook, or I'm going to try to ruin your reputation. So it's poisoned the public discourse to the point where we just did a poll and it got the results last week. A third of the people in the United States of America are afraid they will lose their job for speaking out about what they think. That's a significant chilling of free speech that I don't think we've experienced in this country you know, until the time, since the time of the First Amendment to the Constitution. It could be 200 years before people felt, since people felt this afraid to say what they think. So I wrote this ebook on cancel culture. It's really easy to get. Just Google Summit Ministries and cancel culture, and it's free. It's got, it's got 10, idea, 10 things to think about and do to stop the cancel culture and 10 things to say, mm -hmm. because I have come to believe that you have to engage in the dialogue. The cancel culture only works if people can be at a distance from one another. Like people will say things on Facebook that they would never say if they were sitting with you over coffee, right? Mm -hmm. And it's that, it's that distance that creates the problem. So social media, part of the problem, Social media companies are making it worse. But personal dialogue and understanding why we believe what we believe still works. So share some of these things that we can say when faced with cancel culture, because if we haven't been already impacted by it, we will be at some point. No question. So at, at Summit Ministries, we teach that most people go along a spectrum of avoidance to aggression. Mm -hmm. Avoidance is... Hey, you have your beliefs, I have mine. You have your truth, I have my truth. We'll just have to agree to disagree, that kind of thing. Aggression is, you know, mic drop. Watch Ben Shapiro destroy the pro-lifer in 10 seconds, you know, from the stage or, or whatever. So we have these, this is the spectrum that most people go on. We say add a second dimension, turn it into a triangle. At the top of the triangle is advocacy. We become advocates for two things, advocates for the truth and advocates for other people. In other words, the goal of civil discourse is that we all move closer to the truth through the conversation. If we don't do that, then the conversations can quickly become toxic. So what I'm encouraging people to do is to ask questions. So I work mostly with students who are headed off to the university. Their situation is in the residence hall or in class. So I, I tend to think in that framework. In that situation, the students don't often have the opportunity to say, well, here's what I believe and give an articulate defense that's well scripted like it would be in the movies. Rather, it's just the opportunity to ask questions. Why do you say that? When you use that term, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. How do you know that what you believe is true? What happens if you're wrong? How did you arrive at that conclusion? Expressing curiosity and engaging in the conversation, some of the most important things we can do. But our posture has to be not seeing us as butting heads with other people, but seeing us as walking side by side other people to arrive at an understanding of the truth. Yeah, that's so good. How have you seen cancel culture impact, you know, Gen Z? Because you've worked in youth ministry for years. Um, it seems like cancel culture has really reared its ugly head really in the last decade or so, especially. So how is this impacting the younger generations? In 2017, we did a study with the Barna Research Group, which is headed by David Kinnaman. Mm -hmm. And in the study, we asked about the worldviews of people and found that basically Gen Z has, they have a really mixed up worldview. They don't have a concept of truth, so everything sounds good. But the main finding that surprised me was that 
hurting somebody's feelings is the worst thing you can do to Gen Z. So in fact, we asked the question uh, about this and, and the question, I think it was, it was phrased this way, that if what you think or what you believe offends someone or hurts their feelings, it is wrong. Mm -hmm. Two thirds of church attending self-identified Christian young adults say they believe that. Mm -hmm. That what is true is whether you would know something is true because if someone is offended or if their feelings are hurt, then what you've said is untrue. Mm -hmm. <sighs> There's so many directions to go with that. But part of, the, part of the issue is we have to recognize, as Flannery O'Connor said, is truth doesn't depend on your ability to stomach it. We have to find a way to be able to speak the truth, but biblically we speak it in love. So at Summit, we're always trying to take truth and relationship and view them as two strands of a DNA double helix. You're always looking for connecting points to be able to speak truth in a relational way. When we teach this to young adults who are in this Gen Z generation, we find that they say, oh, okay, I can see myself doing that because I want to be curious about what people believe. I do believe there is a truth and I want the opportunity to communicate it, but I don't have to be mean in the process. Mm -hmm. It's not like I'm going for the clickbait or mic drop moment. I'm just trying to form a relationship with this other person so that we can both be better at seeking the truth. That seems to be working and more young adults are embracing a biblical worldview. So. 4% of young adults who are church attending have a biblical worldview, okay? So 96% don't even know why they're really there. They just are maybe there for the community. By the time they leave Summit Ministries programs, according to a study we did with George Barna this last summer, 86% have a biblical worldview. What changes in the process? They come to believe that a biblical worldview is true. They come to believe that it's defensible, even in a culture that rejects it, and they know that they can do it in a relational way. Those statistics are staggering. 4% have a biblical worldview. Is this a discipleship issue, or how did we get to this point in the church? Yes, it's a, it is a discipleship issue. It, not in the sense that young adults feel that people in the church don't love them. It's a discipleship issue in the sense that they are not convinced that what happens in church on Sunday morning has any bearing to what they do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Yeah. So imagine a 20-something student who's at work and over the water cooler, if, people, if we still have those, but over the water cooler, they, a topic comes up, gender identity or, or whatever it happens to be. Do they f believe that they can defend a biblical worldview in a way that is comprehensible, at least, to the other people who are in the conversation? Mm -hmm. If they feel that, if I say anything at all, like my pastor says it in church, because it always sounds so good from the pulpit, if I see anything like that, people will be offended. I, I could lose my job. Mm -hmm. But if they say, now, wait a second, this is the way you phrased that, and tell me why you know that, because I've heard a lot of people say that, but how do you know that's actually so? When you use the term gender, what do you mean by gender? How do you know that gender and sexuality are different things? And what if there's something bigger than gender that should be the root of our identity? I mean, after all, there are 57 you know, different genders. What are people doing other than slapping a label on their feelings? Is it possible that there is something more, something deeper, something that's more core to who we are as human beings that should define our identity primarily, not necessarily gender or athleticism or academic skill or whatever else people use to identify themselves? Mm -hmm. And when you ask questions like that, you're starting to get at the idea that we are image bearers of God. And that's a fundamental basis for our identity that... Frankly, people in the world really miss. Uh, the latest study on this shows that 75% of young adults say they do not have a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. Wow. So you're seeing the effect of these non-Christian worldviews. And our students are saying, why not give the truth a chance? That's really interesting. Do you think this 
sort of lack of truth and this idea that truth is relative, is this contributing to the deconstruct deconstruction, deconstructive yes, trend right? yes. that we're seeing? Yes. So when I ask my students which of the worldviews we're talking about, we talk about a Christian worldview, and then we show five other worldviews that are I call counterfeits mm -hmm. because they're attempting to replace the Christian worldview and explaining where we came from, what our problem is, and where our salvation is. When I tell them about these different worldviews, the one they choose that they say is most prominent in the culture today is a postmodern worldview, mm -hmm. which says that truth is up to the individual. There's no reality out there. All we have are our perceptions of reality. And those perceptions of reality are socially constructed through our culture and through our daily experiences. That's almost taken as a fact today. That's what people really believe. So is truth relative? Of, to that viewpoint, of course it is. It would be relative to the person, possibly relative to their tribe or culture. Is the truth, is moral truth relative as well? Well, yeah, whatever I believe is true for me is what is the basis of what I do. That's the connection between moral relativism and this worldview of postmodernism. But we have to remember, postmodernism is a religious worldview. Mm -hmm. It says that we came from nothing. We're basically just material beings. Our problem is that people have risen up and insisted that their truth is the truth and they will punish you if you don't agree. And the solution is that we all just are skeptical of all truth claims, mm -hmm. okay? It's a, it's a creation story. It is a story of sin, and it's also a redemption story. The problem is that it starts off in the wrong place. It's wrong in the middle, and its solution doesn't really satisfy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what are some of the issues facing Gen Z and the younger generations um, that maybe that we need to be aware of um, as parents? I have two small children myself. Yeah. I look at the issues facing teens today. I'm 30, and I'm like, well, I didn't have to deal with that 10 years ago. Um, and so it just seems like the problems facing teens are just so different um, than they that's, were even just a few years ago. It's crazy, right, how fast things have shifted in this direction. Well. One, one of the things that I really encourage parents to do is, is think in terms of the DNA of influence, truth and relationship, and trying to connect those two at, at all points along the way. I'm trying to think as a parent, how do I open up a conversation with my kids about different things? Because I've got to keep those lines of communication open. Mm -hmm. um, to me, that is at the core of what we're doing. Society will continue to change. Cultural influences will continue to be there. But I really believe that when we as parents can keep the lines of communication open. So for example, with my teenage kids, when they were, oh, I don't want to talk to you about what happened in school or whatever, it, just to say, well, you know, here's something that I saw on the news. Do your friends ever talk about this? What do they think about it? There's something, there's a song I heard on the radio. Is that a popular song? Is that something? And so I just really play dumb, which is easy for me to do because <laughs> I'm really dumb about a popular culture. But I just continue to ask those sorts of questions. And it's a connecting point. It allows me to see where my kids are and then look for opportunities to bring truth into the situation. So I don't know if that answers your question, yeah, but that's, that's kind of how I'm that's really good. about it. Yeah, no, I love that. That's really helpful. I need all the tips I can get. <laughs> So there is a lot of hand-wringing about Gen Z, you know, all these statistics about young people leaving the church in droves. But what is good about this generation? Why can we still have hope for the next generation of Christian leaders? Well, I, I love being with Gen Z students. I love the creativity. I love the vulnerability. I see a lot of anxiety and depression in, in this generation, but I see them looking for meaning that goes beyond what they know their culture can provide. It's like being a person who, if you know your cupboard is bare and have no idea where your next meal will come from, somebody who brings food to your door means a whole lot more to you than if you've already got everything that you need. That you're, and, and I think this is so, there's something biblical to this. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Mm -hmm. God doesn't fill up people who are already filled up. You know, he's looking for that hunger. He's looking for that thirst. And we, this generation has that in spades. So I think that is to their advantage. I think the fact that they want to be polite, 
they, that they want to be respectful of the viewpoints of others, makes it more likely that they can be those people walking side by side seeking truth. So there are some signs of hope and it is fun working with them. Yeah. So what are some really practical ways that Summit Ministries is equipping the next generation to stand boldly for truth in a postmodern culture? Yeah, well, my favorite part of what we're doing this year at Summit Ministries is we're, we're hosting two week long student conferences, one in Georgia on Lookout Mountain, and then seven of them in Manitou Springs, Colorado. We've also got a week long program in Lexington, Kentucky. And in these programs, students will have a chance to meet major Christian thought leaders, people like John Stone Street from the Colson Center, Sean, Dr. Sean McDowell, son of Josh McDowell, J. Warner Wallace, the cold case detective, and a number of Frank Turek, the author of I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, a number of people who will help them answer their tough questions. Then they do all kinds of outdoor activities from rock climbing to whitewater rafting bond together with other young leaders in their generation to, to become a group of people who stand for truth. And those two-week programs, I mean, we invite any student, 16 to 22 years of age, to participate in those. And it's easy to get the information. I'll put my little plug in. Summit.org is where you can go to find more information. Awesome. Well, thank you, Dr. Jeff. I really appreciate what you do. This is a tremendous ministry. Thanks, Lee. I've really enjoyed our conversation.